October 22nd. Today, our Old Testament reading will be from the book of Jeremiah, chapter 39, verse 1. We'll go through chapter 41, verse 18. God rewarded Zedekiah for his wickedness. That's right. The king thought he could escape, but the enemy caught up with him. The last thing Zedekiah saw was the execution of his own sons. Then he was blinded. He walked by sight and ended up in darkness. He lived to serve himself and lost everything. He learned the truth of these words. Be sure your sin will find you out. God rewarded Jeremiah for his faithfulness. For forty difficult years, he courageously proclaimed God's word, even though the people refused to obey it. We'll read about authority. God has ordained that men live under authority. Otherwise, there's chaos. Gedaliah told the people exactly what Jeremiah had counseled. Submit to the enemy and seek to live normal lives. Are you praying for those in authority? Well, their job is not easy, and they need God's help. And now, let's read all about it as we open up the Old Testament. October 22nd, Jeremiah chapter 39, verse 1, through 41, verse 18. It was January, during the ninth year of King Zedekiah's reign, that King Nebuchadnezzar and his army returned to besiege Jerusalem. Two and a half years later, on July 18th, the Babylonians broke through the wall, and the city fell. All the officers of the Babylonian army came in and sat in triumph at the middle gate. Nergal Sharizer of Samgar, and Nebo Sarsikim, a chief officer, and Nergal Sharizer, the king's advisor, and many others. King Zedekiah and his royal guard saw the Babylonians in the city gate. So they fled when the darkness of night arrived. They went out through a gate between the two walls behind the king's garden and headed toward the Jordan Valley. But the Babylonians chased the king and caught him on the plains of Jericho. They took him to King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon, who was at Riblah in the land of Hamath. There the king of Babylon pronounced judgment upon Zedekiah. He made Zedekiah watch as they killed his sons and all the nobles of Judah. Then he gouged out Zedekiah's eyes, bound him in chains, and sent him away to exile in Babylon. Meanwhile, the Babylonians burned Jerusalem, including the palace, and tore down the walls of the city. Then Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, sent to Babylon the remnant of the population, as well as those who had defected to him. But Nebuzaradan left a few of the poorest people in Judah, and he assigned them fields and vineyards to care for. King Nebuchadnezzar had told Nebuzaradan to find Jeremiah. See that he isn't hurt, he had said. Look after him well, and give him anything he wants. So Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, and Nebuchadnezzar, a chief officer, and Nergal Sharizer, the king's advisor, and the other officers of Babylon's king sent messengers to bring Jeremiah out of the prison. They put him under the care of Gedaliah, son of Ahikam, and grandson of Shaphan, who was to take him back to his home. So Jeremiah stayed in Judah among his own people. The Lord had given the following message to Jeremiah while he was still in prison. Say to Ebed-Melech the Ethiopian, The Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says, I will do to this city everything I have threatened. I will send disaster, not prosperity. You will see its destruction. But I will rescue you from those you fear so much. Because you trusted me, I will preserve your life and keep you safe. I, the Lord, have spoken. The Lord gave a message to Jeremiah after Nebuzaradan, captain of the guard, had released him at Ramah. He had found Jeremiah bound in chains among the captives of Jerusalem and Judah, who were being sent to exile in Babylon. The captain of the guard called for Jeremiah and said, The Lord your God has brought this disaster on this land, just as he said he would. For these people have sinned against the Lord and disobeyed him. That is why it happened. Now I am going to take off your chains and let you go. 
If you want to come with me to Babylon, you are welcome. I will see that you are well cared for. But if you don't want to come, you may stay here. The whole land is before you. Go wherever you like. If you decide to stay, then return to Gedaliah, son of Ahikam, and grandson of Shaphan. He has been appointed governor of Judah by the king of Babylon. Stay there with the people he rules. But it's up to you. Go wherever you like. Then Nebuzaradan gave Jeremiah some food and money and let him go. So Jeremiah returned to Gedaliah, son of Ahikam, at Mizpah, and lived in Judah with the few who were still left in the land. The leaders of the Judean guerrilla bands in the countryside heard that the king of Babylon had appointed Gedaliah, son of Ahikam, as governor over the poor people who were left behind in Judah, and that he hadn't exiled everyone to Babylon. So they came to see Gedaliah at Mizpah. These are the names of the leaders who came. Ishmael, son of Nethaniah, Johanan, and Jonathan, sons of Kareah, Saraiah, son of Tanhumath, the sons of Ephi, the Netophathite, Jazaniah, son of the Maacathite, and all their men. Gedaliah assured them that it would be safe for them to surrender to the Babylonians. Stay here and serve the king of Babylon, he said, and all will go well for you. As for me, I will stay at Mizpah to represent you before the Babylonians who come to meet with us. Settle in any town you wish, and live off the land. Harvest the grapes and summer fruits and olives, and store them away. When the Judeans in Moab, Ammon, Edom, and the other nearby countries heard that the king of Babylon had left a few people in Judah, and that Gedaliah was the governor, they began to return to Judah from the places to which they had fled. They stopped at Mizpah to discuss their plans with Gedaliah, and then went out into the Judean countryside to gather a great harvest of grapes and other crops. Soon after this, Johanan, son of Kareah, and the other guerrilla leaders came to Gedaliah at Mizpah. They said to him, Did you know that Baalis, king of Ammon, has sent Ishmael, son of Nathaniah, to assassinate you? But Gedaliah refused to believe them. Later, Johanan had a private conference with Gedaliah and volunteered to kill Ishmael secretly. Why should we let him come and murder you? Johanan asked. What will happen then to the Judeans who have returned? Why should the few of us who are still left be scattered and lost? But Gedaliah said to Johanan, I forbid you to do any such thing, for you are lying about Ishmael. But in mid-autumn, Ishmael, son of Nethaniah and grandson of Elishama, who was a member of the royal family, arrived in Mizpah accompanied by ten men. Gedaliah invited them to dinner. While they were eating, Ishmael and his ten men suddenly drew their swords and killed Gedaliah, whom the king of Babylon had appointed governor. Then they went out and slaughtered all the Judean officials and Babylonian soldiers who were with Gedaliah at Mizpah. The next day, before anyone had heard about Gedaliah's murder, eighty men arrived from Shechem, Shiloh, and Samaria. They had come to worship at the temple of the Lord. They had shaved off their beards, torn their clothes, and cut themselves, and had brought along grain offerings and incense. Ishmael left Mizpah to meet them, weeping as he went. When he reached them, he said, Oh, come and see what has happened to Gedaliah. But as soon as they were all inside the town, Ishmael and his men killed all but ten of them and threw their bodies into a cistern. The other ten had talked Ishmael into letting them go by promising to bring him their stores of wheat, barley, oil, and honey that they had hidden away. The cistern where Ishmael dumped the bodies of the men he murdered was the large one made by King Azza when he fortified Mizpah to protect himself against King Bahashah of Israel. Ishmael, son of Nethaniah, filled it with corpses. Ishmael made captives of the king's daughters and the other people who had been left under Gedaliah's care in Mizpah by Nebuzaradan, captain of the guard. Taking them with him, he started back toward the land of Ammon. But when Johanan, son of Korea, and the rest of the guerrilla leaders heard what Ishmael had done, they took all their men and set out to stop him. They caught up with him at the pool near Gibeon. 
the people Ishmael had captured shouted for joy when they saw Johanan and his men. And all the captives from Mizpah escaped and began to help Johanan. Meanwhile, Ishmael and eight of his men escaped from Johanan into the land of Ammon. Then Johanan, son of Korea, and his officers led away all the people they had rescued, warriors, women, children, and palace officials. They took them all to the village of Garuth Kimham near Bethlehem, where they prepared to leave for Egypt. They were afraid of what the Babylonians would do when they heard that Ishmael had killed Gedaliah, the governor appointed by the Babylonian king. October 22nd. As we look into the New Testament today, we'll be reading from the book of 2 Timothy chapter 1, beginning at uh, verse 1. We'll open up the, this book for the first time here, and we'll go through verse 18. And we'll see here in 2 Timothy 1 that uh, perhaps some of the so-called enemies that attacked Timothy are attacking you and making you want to give up. Beware of self-pity. Timothy was having a hard time in Ephesus and wanted to leave. Perhaps that caused his tears. When you start feeling sorry for yourself, remember that others are praying for you and that God still honors your faith. We'll also read about neglect. Be careful of that in uh, your life. Timothy had neglected his spiritual life, and the flame was low on the altar of his heart. No wonder he needed to exercise himself. And also watch out for carelessness. Paul committed the message to Timothy, and Timothy's responsibility was to guard it and share it with others. Again, the Spirit of God enables us to be faithful. And with that, let's begin today's reading in the New Testament. October 22nd, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 1 through 18. This letter is from Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by God's will, sent out to tell others about the life he has promised through faith in Christ Jesus. It is written to Timothy, my dear son, may God our Father and Christ Jesus our Lord give you grace, mercy, and peace. Timothy, I thank God for you. He is the God I serve with a clear conscience, just as my ancestors did. Night and day I constantly remember you in my prayers. I long to see you again for I remember your tears as we parted. And I will be filled with joy when we are together again. I know that you sincerely trust the Lord, for you have the faith of your mother Eunice and your grandmother Lois. This is why I remind you to fan into flames the spiritual gift God gave you when I laid my hands on you. For God has not given us a spirit of fear and timidity, but of power, love, and self-discipline so you must never be ashamed to tell others about our Lord. And don't be ashamed of me either, even though I'm in prison for Christ. With the strength God gives you, be ready to suffer with me for the proclamation of the good news. It is God who saved us and chose us to live a holy life. He did this not because we deserved it, but because that was His plan long before the world began to show His love and kindness to us through Christ Jesus. And now He has made all of this plain to us by the coming of Christ Jesus our Savior, who broke the power of death and showed us the way to everlasting life through the good news. And God chose me to be a preacher, an apostle, and a teacher of this good news. And that is why I am suffering here in prison. But I am not ashamed of it, for I know the one in whom I trust, and I am sure that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him until the day of his return. Hold on to the pattern of right teaching you learned from me, and remember to live in the faith and love that you have in Christ Jesus. With the help of the Holy Spirit, who lives within us, carefully guard what has been entrusted to you. As you know, all the Christians who came here from the province of Asia have deserted me. Even Phygelus, and Hermogenes are gone. May the Lord show special kindness to Onesiphorus and all his family, because he often visited and encouraged me. He was never ashamed of me because I was in prison. When he came to Rome, he searched everywhere until he found me. 
May the Lord show him special kindness on the day of Christ's return. And you know how much he helped me at Ephesus. Psalm 90, verse 1, through chapter 91, verse 16. Well, the somber tone of this psalm suggests that Moses may have written it when the nation rebelled in unbelief at Kadesh Barnea. God announced that everybody 20 years old and older would die within the next 40 years. No wonder Moses prayed, so teach us to number our days. Now, in light of eternity, life is brief no matter how long you live. You need God's help to use your days wisely and joyfully. There is real satisfaction in doing God's will, revealing God's glory, and growing in God's beauty. Now, what a relief to uh, turn to Psalm 91 as we continue here. I turn to this psalm and move out of the shadows into the sunshine. In light of the sobering admonitions of Psalm 90, we appreciate even more the sublime assurances of Psalm 91. The theme is security. God preserves those who abide in Him and love Him. These promises are not for people who run to the Lord only in times of danger, but for those who dwell in His presence and make the Holy of Holies their habitation. Psalm 90, verse 1, through chapter 91, verse 16. A prayer of Moses, the man of God. Lord, through all the generations, you have been our home. Before the mountains were created, before you made the earth and the world, you are God, without beginning or end. You turn people back to dust, saying, Return to dust. For you, a thousand years are as yesterday. They are like a few hours. You sweep people away like dreams that disappear, or like grass that springs up in the morning. In the morning it blooms and flourishes, but by evening it is dry and withered. We wither beneath your anger. We are overwhelmed by your fury. You spread out our sins before you, our secret sins, and you see them all. We live our lives beneath your wrath. We end our lives with a groan. Seventy years are given to us. Some may even reach eighty. But even the best of these years are filled with pain and trouble. Soon they disappear, and we are gone. Who can comprehend the power of your anger? Your wrath is as awesome as the fear you deserve. Teach us to make the most of our time, so that we may grow in wisdom. O oh Lord, come back to us. How long will you delay? Take pity on your servants. Satisfy us in the morning with your unfailing love, so we may sing for joy to the end of our lives. Give us gladness in proportion to our former misery. Replace the evil years with good. Let us see your miracles again. Let our children see your glory at work. And may the Lord our God show us His approval and make our efforts successful. Yes, make our efforts successful. Those who live in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. This I declare of the Lord. He alone is my refuge, my place of safety. He is my God, and I am trusting Him. For He will rescue you from every trap and protect you from the fatal plague. He will shield you with His wings. He will shelter you with His feathers. His faithful promises are your armor and protection. Do not be afraid of the terrors of the night, nor fear the dangers of the day, nor dread the plague that stalks in darkness, nor the disaster that strikes at midday. Though a thousand fall at your side, though ten thousand are dying all around you, these evils will not touch you. But you will see it with your eyes. You will see how the wicked are punished. If you make the Lord your refuge, if you make the Most High your shelter, no evil will conquer you, no plague will come near your dwelling, for He orders His angels to protect you wherever you go. They will hold you with their hands to keep you from striking your foot on a stone. You will trample down lions and poisonous snakes. 
you will crush fierce lions and serpents under your feet. The Lord says, I will rescue those who love me. I will protect those who trust in my name. When they call on me, I will answer. I will be with them in trouble. I will rescue them and honor them. I will satisfy them with a long life and give them my salvation. Proverbs 26, verses 1 and 2. Honor doesn't go with fools any more than snow with summer or rain with harvest. Like a fluttering sparrow or a darting swallow, an unfair curse will not land on its intended victims.